It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Nance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Backbone Planning Partners is a marketing name for registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Now let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm your host here, as always, Austin Peterson, and joined by the best co-host in the business, Landon Mance, live from Las Vegas, Nevada, the Sin City, as they call it. We had a conversation earlier where uh, somebody asked if I lived in Las Vegas as well, and I said, no, I don't sin nearly as much as Landon does. That's It's the right place for Landon. <laughs> Well, that joke really landed. I know that there were people laughing when they listened to that. But listen, I'll tell you what, if this is the first time you're listening to our podcast, welcome. We're glad you're here. We hope you find some value here and some entertainment. We are a podcast for small business owners by small business owners. Landon and I are both small business owners. We also come from families, parents and grandparents of small business owners. We believe that the entrepreneur in this country is truly the backbone of the American economy. And so we put together this podcast and we've been hosting it for a little over a year and a half now. And we enjoy doing it. We, get, we enjoy providing an opportunity for small business owners to tell their story and, and to provide that platform for them. So with that today, we are excited to have definitely a tycoon in, in the building with us today, Neil Twa, CEO of Voltage Digital Marketing, coming to us live from the Ozarks in Missouri, as they say. Neil, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. In Missouri or Misery or whatever you want to say about it, right? <laughs> I know we're not any representation of the Ozark show because I get that question too. I haven't actually seen the show, but I, I heard I probably should since yeah, it may involve my business at someday in the future. It is definitely entertaining. And uh, Landon and I will be be clear that the the show Ozark does not represent what we do as financial planners either. <laughs> so, disclaimer. <laughs> new disclaimer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, uh, exactly. So, Neil, before we jump into the business side of things and, and what, you know, Voltage Digital Marketing does, we always like to have our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. And, you know, we've we've had kind of an intro call with you. We know a little bit about you, but our listeners don't. So, you know, start from the beginning. Tell us where you grew up. Tell us about your family, kids, all that kind of thing. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll try to save the stuff that's only passionately interesting with my mom, and I'll try to get to the basics here. Um, so I was asked earlier in the green room where, you know, did I grow up and I come from Missouri? And the truth is, yeah, I actually came from Missouri. Uh, but I ended up in Oregon and grew up there and had a lot of fun. It's what I like to refer to as real Boy Scouts. Um, everybody talks about doing Boy Scouts and they go to the table and they do these little arts and crafts. No, we dug holes in the dirt and stayed out over the weekend and had to stay alive. That was Boy Scouts for me growing up. So as I got older and realized I wanted to, to get into to more of that, I was going to head to military or go to school. I had a why in the road. I wanted to go be a fighter pilot. That's really what I wanted to do. Uh, when I showed up to the recruiter office, I had Navy or Air Force on deck, and both of them looked at me and said, you're 6'4", 250 plus pound man. You are not getting in a fighter cockpit. And I'm like, dang it. They're like, you can fly these uh, big C-130 Hercules or transport or whatever. And I'm like, I have no interest in doing that. So I went to college uh, where I suffered an entrepreneurial death. Um, I had a full ride music scholarship in classical and jazz. Uh, so my tuition was paid for. So I really didn't have a, a desire to per se you know, pursue that. And so by year three, when I realized I was probably going to be living in a van down by the river, uh, it was time for me to change my degree or to get out of business. So I bailed out of college my third year, went off on an adventure. I'm not that old in terms of the world, but the internet wasn't a thing yet. <laughs> it just become a thing and university and it wasn't going to teach me what to do. So I went to the corporate world where then follow the money trail. And I basically applied learning and knowledge along the way, uh, knowing at some point I was going to leave all that behind. I always wanted to do my own thing. Uh, and knew that I would eventually be in the entrepreneurial game. I just wasn't sure. So I started a game server side hustle business. We had 20 game servers and about 10,000 people um, using a voiceover uh, IP codex because games at that point did not have it built in. I'm like, I'm aging myself out of this conversation really fast. But we went along and we did really well with that. And I eventually worked myself into the top into Sprint and I worked myself into um, IBM where I got picked up. It's been about five years. 
uh, in IBM until 2007 and um, was doing human machine language learning interface, artificial intelligence uh, for the customer service world uh, around search engines and other things, specifically for the mobile high tech oil and gas industries. Uh, I got very involved in that and started my own hustle in 2007 as a management consultant. By that point, uh, I'd already burned through one marriage. That was terrible. Uh, learned what I shouldn't do in marriage, which I'm now successfully married for 15 years, I'd like to say. Uh, she has tolerated me this long, but I now have four beautiful daughters who are all born in four and a half years. So we have a very busy household. We homeschool our daughters after the last nine years, uh, alternatives to education, uh, as well as alternatives to business. We'll talk probably about more of that, I'm sure. But figured out I had a really good aptitude in online media buying and got very strong at generating leads for mobile companies, cost per installation and affiliate stuff like that. Before anybody had mobile you know, interfaces, Facebook and AdWords and this kind of stuff, we were uploading it in spreadsheets uh, and just doing Hail Mary passes on our campaign to see what would work. And as it turns out, we struck gold in South Africa, of all places, uh, with a series of mobile dating apps um, that really led to me understanding you know, the physical product world, because we were doing a, a component of that with mobile. And then we switched into learning brand building and brand building led to products and products led me to a person who said, Hey, did you know you could sell on Amazon? And I had no idea you could do that. I said, if it's like eBay, I want nothing to do with it because I don't want garage sale crap and I don't want to hold the products and whatever. He said, no, 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 no. This is even better. They, they take the products, they sell the products, they go last mile to the customer. You got to check this out. So that's very cool. Well, nine years later, <laughs> I am now a, a case study for good to great for Jim Collins. I'm a hedgehog in the market. I've stayed in the business of uh, software development and product brand building, specifically in e-commerce. And we focus on the uh, FBA channel within Amazon. Uh, and we mature those brands. And then we take them out to mass market after that. Once they've matured on Amazon, they have real mass market appeal. Uh, so between family, life, and business, I'm, like you said, in the Ozarks, extremely busy on my property, 40 acres dogs, four by fours, hunting, you name it. My other family members have moved out here. So between either the day or the week, we may either have a community or a compound, uh, depending upon how you want to look at it. <laughs> so now we're up to 65 acres and four homesteads out here in the country. And frankly, after being a city boy and living in New York and hanging out in Manhattan and all this stuff, uh, I find myself actually uh, in my soul loving the Ozarks and loving the mountains and loving the farm life and the everything we do out here on the homestead from the ducks and chickens to the geese and the deer that were in the backyard before I came on this call. So that's a little bit too much about me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's definitely a lot to unpack there. The first oh, thing sure that, actually, <laughs> that actually came to mind for me is my administrative assistant, Lindsay, yep. her husband, Lance, is a fighter pilot, like a real live fighter pilot. And he he's walked into our office, the, the office that Landon's sitting in there in Las Vegas in his flight suit. You know, he walks in and makes us look like we're idiots. Look, I mean, he even looks like Tom Cruise. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, what is going on? He's got the flight suit. He's got that look. What happened to the rest of us? You know, that's the other part. They looked at me and were like, no, you don't fit the role, dude. Sorry. You're, you don't fit the cockpit. You don't fit the role. It's like, oh, that's so sad. But yeah, I have some fighter pilot friends now who are uh, former fighter pilots are now commercial airline pilots. They go out and fly the, fly the big boys now, which is where a lot of them go, which is cool. But it wasn't my track in life um, to do that. And one of the things that's probably appropriate to unpack in all of that was the thing I didn't say, uh, the cons. I obviously had trouble with business. Who doesn't when you push the, push the lines and small businesses do uh, occasionally have to push the lines to see where things are. And I went bankrupt once. Uh, it was a strategic call. We can talk about that a little bit because I always want people to see the pros and cons and it's not all just green grass and all that stuff. You got challenges. It's a, it's the plate full of spaghetti. So let's be really honest, right? I mean, I, I crashed and burned a business that I leveraged too far into. And when I discovered the partners were leveraging their own version of the books, uh, that's when things started to unravel really fast. And the lawyers said, you have a big choice to make. You know, It's a strategic bankruptcy to indemnify you, which I'm glad I did. Uh, and that we got that all taken care of because later on the SEC wanted to take a look at things and I was out. <laughs> so I had to reinvent myself. And that was a, a part of getting into that online lead marketing uh, that really changed directions from the management and consulting side and uh, even patents and stuff I had on oil and gas technologies. There are probably some of the really cool technologies no one's ever going to hear about because they got buried. <laughs> but that's the way it works in small business life. It is, you know, and I, I think that that's, you're right. That's just as important. Maybe the most important thing that we'll discuss today is, yeah. you know, yeah. how that happened, really, of course. But 
and, and, you know, maybe things for people to, to watch out for. Yeah. But more importantly, I would say is how did you rebuild after that? Right. How did you go from there yep. to where you are today? And, and the reality is a lot of super successful entrepreneurs had the exact same issue that you had. Right. Oh, very much so. Many of my friends have gone bankrupt multiple times. And I look at it and I'm like, well, how did you do that? And where did you end up too? Because I obviously don't want to ever follow that path again. And, you know, it's really easy to say to somebody who's been down that path, well, you know, you're a failure. Why would I ever trust anything you say after that? And I actually had a call the other day with a guy in New Zealand uh, who was asking me that question based on his audience. Why do, why do people think it's more acceptable in America to have financial problems? And then, you know, come back from them even stronger. Whereas my culture kind of sees that as a derogatory. We shouldn't touch that person anymore. They're like leprosy. And I didn't have a very strong answer for him, but I've had a chance to think about it since then. Um, One of the uh, fundamental beauties of America, whether people like it or not, or whether they're going to argue with me about the next few minutes or not, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, America is still one of the number one opportunities in the world to build or grow any type of business model uh, legally or ethically uh, capable of doing. Um, And that is still a tremendous opportunity that most do not recognize until they get outside of this country uh, and learn about the troubles and difficulties that others have. So here we sort of wear as Americans as a badge of honor uh, that you've you've had some troubles, but you've overcome them and you've exceeded the expectations of yourself or others around you because you overcame those. That's something to look up to. It's something to aspire to. I take that with a grain of salt, but I also realize that true entrepreneurial folks truly understand that you are going to take and fail seven times and three of them are going to do very well. And if you know anything about baseball, you know, that would get you in the hall of fame, right? But you have to remember, you're going to, you're going to fail out seven times. Uh, The three you put money, energy, and effort into are going to be home runs. Okay. And they'll make up for all the other failures. And until I actually had that major failure, did I fully understand that? And the thing leading to that, that I then diagnosed later on and became more clear about as I broke that down and had to reinvent, reinvent myself was the realization, again, that too many eggs in one basket. It's a, it's a common cliche to some degree. What I've now realized is, um, of course, diversity and diversification are important in business. Um, not so diversified that you're stepping into things so outside the realm of your knowledge, understanding, or capability that you're ultimately setting yourself up for failure, but close enough that you, as I mentioned earlier, can hedgehog into things that lead to those additional opportunities or additional revenue streams that you can unpack. It's what I fell in love with e-commerce about. Uh, It's why I started the game server company and knew that eventually e-commerce was going to be a big component of that. I always had the dream and vision that that would one day realize itself somehow. Now I've touched a bunch of e-commerce businesses and models along the way But ultimately, the one that I found most in tune with was leveraging Amazon's infrastructure to prove a product or brand in mass market. Now, others would say you can't make it profitable or it doesn't make any sense or it's too complicated or you're putting all of your eggs in Amazon's basket. And to some degree, that is true. However, in time, money, legal and others, there are ways to reduce that risk uh, in the way you do the business model. You just have to be in it long enough and understand it enough to realize there are things you can maneuver in that business model to lower that risk while creating the upside and opportunity. And that's, again, getting deeper into that. And I did not experience that when I put so many eggs into one basket and eventually went bankrupt. So as I got out of that, I started to really appreciate and understand a very simple concept. If I'm going to put 10 million into any business model of any kind, I'm going to put a million into 10 businesses. I'm not going to put 10 million into one business. And if you understand that concept of investment in terms of the dollar figure, then you understand it in terms of the risk and you understand it in terms of diversification. And you don't technically get that until you've walked it. If you're able to catch that and you're able to execute that prior to ever having the risk that I did, kudos to you. Uh, And that's where I found myself leveraging mentors a lot more uh, than just hard expertise because I have the University of Hard Knocks. <laughs> My whole life has been one hard knock after another <laughs> from the moment I jumped out of college, as we were talking about in the dream room. No, I do not have a college education. And yeah, that is a badge of honor for me. Why? Because adaptability. Because I learned to become an expert in the areas in which I stay focused in. Uh, I leveraged authority so that others would understand uh, my practicability. And one very clear and concise thing was that I know basically that network is net worth. And it is who you know that keeps you there 
uh, excuse me, who you know that gets you there and what you know that keeps you there. So you can make those relationships, but if you don't know what you're talking about, you'll fail out really fast. Uh, and you can't lie your way through it because it eventually will catch you up. So my experience then was to obviously diversify my business and brand building e-commerce was a way to do that because I can brand multiple kinds of brands across Amazon, across different markets and categories, which lowers my risk, but keeps me in that same vertical. And when I started to identify that, I started to go into more and more brands. And so eventually we had eight brands uh, running in our system and we did over 100 million in FBA businesses collectively with our clients. Technically, it's a lot more than that, but it sounds really stupid when you say it out loud. But you know, we've done close to 500 million. Just a couple of the brands that our clients have done have been over 60 million a year. It is a model that has turned into a business that has turned into the whole operation that is Voltage today. It has grown and evolved itself into multiple streams from the software to the training, to the mentorship, to the acquisition and exiting of these businesses, which now makes up our whole portfolio. So a couple follow-up questions to that. So it, it kind of sounds like, and again, this is, I've got some prior knowledge because we've had, you know, we've had a conversation or two, but right. so you and your team have, have, have had a lot of success in this, in this area. But I, I believe now that you've kind of, um, lack of a better word, productized this this approach and this process, and now you you help to guide people through this process so they can do it themselves. So maybe talk to us about why, if you know, if you guys are having a lot of success doing it yourselves, why did you decide to kind of offer this, you know, to the public? Right. Why would and then as you as you transition into that, you know, kind of walk us through that 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 process. When someone comes yeah. to you and says, "I'm really interested in working with you," what how do I what does that look and feel like, and and what does that consist of? Kind of just talk us through that, if you would. Well, the simple word to borrow here is leverage. Okay, I between the individuals that we work and choose to work with on an invite only mentorship, they are strategically chosen. Uh, based on meeting the goals and objectives thereafter and those that Voltage are matching up with. So as the saying goes, when the student is ready, the mentor will appear. So as people then recognize they want this opportunity, they understand that my nine years in this business has leveraged uh, many ups and downs in the model, many recent changes with supply chain and logistics in the last 24 months, yet our businesses are stronger than ever. Why? Because we built redundancy and systems in place that take the average would take the average person in the five plus years to do in a million dollars. We can build the leverage of our infrastructure, experience, and knowledge, operate with them in a franchise-like capacity where we don't take ownership or profits from them, and then give them that hand up to go out there and do it even faster. That's a leverage that I can deploy for someone uh, to get them results and ability to compete in today's marketplace. Whereas if they went at an individual level and tried to do it themselves, they would face a very strong uphill battle uh, because the market has gone more competitive and the market has changed altogether. And as we've all experienced, e-commerce has taken a huge double-digit growth in the last 24 months due to certain things we won't say out on this call, but um, obvious opportunities when there's bloods in the street, uh, there are opportunities to be made. And right now, there's a lot of blood in e-commerce for businesses who are lacking product knowledge or supply chain capabilities to keep up with demand. Demand is obviously there. Money is there. Supply chain is lagging a bit. So those who have supply chain are meeting up the other two just fine. So we give that opportunity for people to come in on a very limited basis, um, only so many people at a time. It gives me the opportunity to leverage their time and our time so that I don't have to work 200 hours a week. Uh, while I teach them to become the CEO of this business, they can leverage my infrastructure, gain that knowledge and, and speed to market, speed to revenue while learning how to make these profitable right from the very beginning with the end in mind, which leveraged the original concept of any business or business that was created to be exited. A business was a short-term entity. It was never meant to, to uh, work in perpetuity. I know you guys know that. So in this model of brand building, these businesses are grown in 12 to 18 months and they're exited. And that is the model. So as we build them profitably and scale them quickly, we can then leverage two to three years worth of profits and then do it again even faster. So that becomes what we call our platinum principle, which is kind of borrowing that whole uh, exit, you know, uh, golden parachute, uh, except someone else plays with it and they tell you what to get and then you bounce out and it's a whole corporate thing. On this end, you pull the parachute anytime you want. Uh, and we have a whole portfolio of hedge funds and investors and accredited investors and home offices who want to buy these things and are banging down my door literally every week. Can we buy your companies? 
And I said, just wait, I've got business builders that are maturing. And pretty soon, you know, I introduce them to the uh, builders and the companies that are coming up. So we can leverage multiple companies for exit beyond me creating an entire infrastructure. I have no employees. I have no warehouses. I don't need any of that. I have a lifestyle business that lets the other people understand my lifestyle business can be theirs while leveraging economies of scale, which is what Amazon's FBA infrastructure truly gives me. It gives me the ability to build multi-seven figure and eight-figure businesses without warehouses or employees. Show me another model that can do that. Um, that's what I absolutely love about this. So real quick, for those who are listening and aren't familiar, I mean, I think everybody's familiar with Amazon, but they're definitely not familiar with how the Amazon businesses work. And they specifically don't know what FBA stands for. Absolutely. So, yeah. Tell us what that stands for and, and how those types of businesses work on Amazon. Absolutely. I'm throwing around a lot of acronyms. So thank you for calling me out on that. Uh, fulfilled by Amazon, FBA means that Amazon handles the last mile to the customer. I don't need a warehouse or infrastructure in order to deliver my customer uh, the products that they asked for. Amazon will do that for me uh, in two days uh, or up to an hour if you're in a city center. So my kind of, uh, what we do is we borrow a simple equation. Similarity plus familiarity equals trust. I can bring a new brand and product line into Amazon that no one's ever heard of, compete with three or four brands that no one's ever heard of, and have Amazon's trust factor deliver that product for me along with the authority until such time as my brand can overtake the authority by itself, at which point I can now take that brand into household names. Does that make sense? So I'm slingshotting off of Amazon. That's its best principle. Can I make it profitable? Yes. Can I cash flow? Absolutely. Because we know the phrase, revenue is vanity. If you guys know this one, profit is sanity and cash flow is king. I can cash flow Amazon businesses profitably all the way up until time of sale. So given that, I can determine if I want to expand that channel beyond Amazon into retail, wholesale, or other locations. We have uh, connections with one of the largest drop shippers in the country. We have uh, my partner, Kevin Harrington, and portfolios to expand into uh, other mass media and marketing channels. We can take those brands and make them even farther out and take them farther into the market before we exit them, or we can exit them at the Amazon-only channel. Given that uh, now $7 billion has been deployed into purchasing uh, these Amazon businesses, uh, private label brands, products that we own that are registered with Amazon and are also brand trademarked, very important. It's called intellectual property, IP, right? We own the intrinsic value of that business at the time we sell it. Now, it just happens to leverage Amazon's channel for the sales, okay? The 630 plus million a day in sales that are chugging across the Amazon. In my house, we call it subscribe and uh, spend. <laughs> it's not subscribe and save uh, because my wife and children uh, are girls and my wife meets the demographic of Amazon's largest buyer type, which is women 27 plus. And the average seller FBA is around two and a half million sellers. That makes up around a little over 350 million a day in sales that go to third-party sellers just like us on Amazon. So it is a small business opportunity for those individuals who want to get out there. What I typically find, and this is the big gotcha, Austin, in the back end of that question, is that those who are considering this a side hustle or a hobby business will ultimately never see it reach the fruition that they want it to be. There has to be some time appropriated to it. There has to be capital deployed to it. There obviously needs to be an understanding of how do you reach people in that market with the brand they've never heard of before and get them to trust your brand above somebody else's. So there's some definite marketing and strategies that we take into effect here. But let's not forget, it's a giant search engine of products. <laughs> it's like a Google of products. And they sell things to all people in 30 seconds or less. That was Bezos' mantra, and he hit it. And they're selling all kinds of things. Now, one of the things we don't play is in the mosh pit of Amazon, as I refer to it, which is where you see all this anxiety and crashing, and you don't want to go down because there's a crazy looking guy with the tattoos on his arm going around beating people up and knocking over women. So we don't play around down in the bottom of the mosh pit of Amazon, which are price is usually $30 or less, where it's thought to be that if I'm a bestseller or what's called an Amazon choice or my product reaches some high-end visibility within Amazon's main uh, website pages, et cetera, then I'm going to make a lot more money. That's actually a race to the bottom. Most people don't understand that. So we play in products and brand affinities that are $50 to $300 in retail price, typically average around $100. Uh, in retail price and usually have profits between $35 to $50 in gross profit on those units. Uh, that gives me the capability of paying myself 
making it profitable and buying up as much of that customer traffic from my competitors inside of Amazon as I can afford. And when I do that, I will absolutely dominate their brand. And it just takes four to six months to do that. And once that's done, they can't catch me because they can't launch another product in which they can come back and redominate me because I am now at the top of that market. And as I do that, it isn't about moving 3,000 units a month. Everybody thinks that winning is how much product you move. It's a big misnomer. If you go watch Google and YouTubes and you go do search anything around this product, it's all about how many units you sell. I couldn't give a flying leap about how many units I sell. It's about how much profit I make per unit. That's all you should care about because that makes the profitable brand. That makes a profitable profit and loss statement, the P&L. That's all I care about. And if I'm going to compete in the marketplace today, I'm going to buy all your customers and they're going to love my product. And they're going to stay with me and they're going to buy two and three more of my products, which we refer to in the marketing world as customer lifetime value. And that customer is going to produce between $500 to $1,000 a year in revenue for me per customer. And 90 day run rates and cash flow, annual run rates have to meet those objections. We run it like a business. When it reaches those metrics and numbers, people are willing to pay three to four X EBITDA for those businesses on a single Amazon channel. And there's a huge market for that. And it's very profitable. (laughs) So the leveraged infrastructure gives us the buyers. It gives us the ability to scale without warehouse employees or overhead. uh, And it gives us that ability to prove that product and brand name when no one's ever heard of it. So one of the things that you mentioned, and sorry if I cut you off there, Landon. Oh, you're okay. Go ahead. You talk about there's just a handful, you know, you're, you know, one when the when the uh, student is is ready, the mentor will appear. You know that sort of thing. So obviously, there's the there's the importance of having a person or a group of people, a team that is going to to do this with you, and that can put in the time and put in the effort. And it's not a side hustle, but you're you know you're really committed to this. Yes. But the other side of that is the product itself or the line of products. Correct. So talk to us about that. Do they typically come to you with a line of products? Are you matching them with a the product? How does that process work? Uh, in our world, we call that what the hell to sell um, because it's the first question that everybody says. Um, and back once upon a time on one of my first ever coaching calls, uh, after we've made a couple of stores successful, we got approached by people. I know it sounds cliche, but family and friends were like, hey, what the heck is going on? So we showed a few people and I got on a call one time with this guy. I go through the whole you know, mind uh, mapping thing. We go through the whole train your brain exercise. This is about a 20 minute effort to help him, you know, build a little brain video, a little mind video of what's actually supposed to occur when he, you know, gets the concept of a product that he can sell. And I remember very succinctly, we get through that and I asked him, you know, what do you think? He goes, okay, I understand all that, but what the hell do I sell? So to answer that question has become the forefront of literally everything we've done. It always starts with the product, as I mentioned earlier. And how do you identify a product that you can sell? Let me take you through a little mental exercise so you guys can kind of see one of the ways we've overcome that. Uh, If you are a buyer on Amazon, and I suspect you are, if you have a woman in your life who's 27 plus, could be a significant other, a girlfriend, could be a friend you can name, could be your wife, could be you. Uh, When you look at your 90 days history of purchasing on Amazon, there is a product that I will give you a 99% guarantee that you can sell, sell profitably and build an entire brand on. You just did not recognize during your purchasing what exactly the solution was you were trying to solve with that product. And you did buy it for a solution. If you were to go back and look at all those products and then start to evaluating, well, why did I buy this pencil set? Or why did I buy this little widget? Or why did I buy that supplement? Or why? There was a solution oriented purchasing behavior. Now, emotions may have kicked in to some degree. But the solution component of it was in there somewhere. You wanted to solve a problem for yourself, a family member, a child, or some other thing that drove you to buy that. Now, here's one of the things you might have thought you were actually doing when you purchased and go back and look at those products from the last 90 days inside of your order history on Amazon. What you're not necessarily identifying is that the price was not the only data point that made you a a buying decision. It's the default price point we go to in our mind that we think something has a value for when it provides a solution to us, either in its most appropriate uh, timeframe or its appropriate activity in which we're going to use it in order for it to reach that solution. Could be the shoes that eventually help us run the 10K when we've only ran a 3K. Could be you know, the, the weight loss pills that are gonna help you go or the the fact that you're gonna bulk up because you're too skinny or whatever it is, it's solution. 
Um, it really gets down to realizing there's a whole solution-oriented group of buyers inside of Amazon that are not all price-centric, just like they aren't anywhere else in any other brand-driven market. What you need to look at is, why did I purchase that? Was it more brand-driven than emotional? And if I believed that this product could create a solution for me that's faster, cheaper, or easier, was cheap the only value point in that statement? And a lot of times, it's not. It's why people will pay extra money for a vehicle, a car, a television, when the brand-driven emotions are tied to that. It's why there's Honda Accords, and there's also Acuras, <laughs> right? It's why there's Camrys, but there's also Lexus. So we build products that are solution-oriented, right? I mean, if you got a hurt tooth, and it's killing you, and it's gone into your head, and you woke up the next morning, are you going to call the doctor, and he's going to say, sure, that's a one hour, sir, and we'll get that whole thing done in an hour, and it's 300 bucks? Are you gonna are you gonna go for that, or are you gonna say um, what else do you got? And he's gonna say no problem. I have it out in five minutes for five hundred bucks. Do you want that solution? You're like heck yeah, get the thing out of me. Five minutes, five hundred bucks. Let's do it. Not everyone is geared towards just price. So we have exercises beyond the one I just told you to show you how to go after those high level affinity customers on Amazon. You may only move. 250 to 750 units of that product a month, but it will be a profitable revenue stream. And as you hedgehog into that brand and you continue to solve, excuse me, the solutions for that person, you will find they will buy two and three other products from you. You will understand they bought those products from you. And instead of paying for the $29 Chinese cheap bike seat that hurts your butt when they go riding, they're going to pay for the nice gel one with the pad on it that would take up the back of Pike's Peak and doesn't crunch in much of goodies. Because they have, then they'll buy the two hundred and fifty or the thousand dollar paneers, and then they'll buy the bigger bike helmet, and then they will pay more money for the solutions that solve their issues. Okay, so if you can go back and picture that, if you can go back and go through your list, you will find those products, and almost guaranteed, you bought from a third party seller, you just didn't realize it. You put it in the hands and money in some third party seller, maybe like me, uh, who have bought those products in the past. I actually ran into one of these ladies in a Las Vegas airport, which is funny. Uh, because I noticed she had some tea towels and I looked and from a distance, um, I'm like, wait, that might be one of the products we're selling. And I went up to her and asked her where she got it. She said she got it on Amazon. And I said, oh yeah, what was? And she named the brand. And I said, oh, that's my product. And the look on her face was like, what? <laughs> she didn't recognize that it came from a third party. She thought it came from Amazon. Uh, and that is a leveraged opportunity that everyone could take advantage of. And we show people how to do that. We validate the products to ensure that they launch with a profitable product. I will not let my people under my mentorship go the wrong direction. If I had had a mentor back previous to the bankruptcy situation, I guarantee I wouldn't have gone bankrupt. They would have stopped me from walking off that cliff. And I didn't have the luxury of that at that point. And now I understand the value of it greatly. Real quick, if you would, because as you were saying that, my wheels were kind of spinning. And uh, you know, when, when you're helping somebody launch a new product, mm -hmm. And it sounds like the entire premise behind your methodology is the, the profitability per, per unit as opposed to mass units. So a little bit more focused on quality versus quantity. I don't know if that's the right way to put that's it. That's a simple but, way to put it. Okay, got it. So they say, okay, this all sounds wonderful, right? But how do you explain to them or how do you give them the confidence that what you are proposing is actually going to be profitable so you know do you build models so that they can wrap their head around the financials or how do you get them to this place where they're like okay i i get it now i understand why you're saying Absolutely. this is going to be profitable yeah, you got to go what we call by the numbers, right? You've got to go by the data. Once you take the emotions out of the way, and let me help for anybody who's listening, you're going to sell to women 27 plus. So get your emotions out of the way, okay? Um, brand designers uh, are going to show you how to do the women 27 plus brand demographic. So we'll get that out of the way. When it gets down to it, it literally runs the business by the numbers. If the product does not meet the criteria of three profitability metrics, you don't launch that product. Um, it will be based on market research of current competitors. It'll be based on product and retail pricing. And of course, cost of what's called cost of goods or that product's cost uh, determined by Amazon's fees, what are referred to as their referral fees for selling a unit inside of their system, uh, as well as other data points like uh, stock, uh, refunds, returns, manufacturing, et cetera, that all have to fit into the cost of those goods, uh, which we refer to as a landed price point or landed cost of goods. That is that from manufacturer 
to customer doorstep, there's an entire cost structure built into that. There's a 27 point spreadsheet. I know it sounds dumb, but you wouldn't believe how many major corporations just run on spreadsheets. They think they're so technically advanced, and yet they all run on spreadsheets. Uh, we have a 27 line item spreadsheet that all the data goes into. It's pre calculated, it's run millions of units, and obviously, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars through this equation. If it does not match up with what we call green lights, you don't sell it. You go to the next product. And once you've done your data research, once you've gone by the numbers to determine profitability and criteria match up your ability, uh, given a certain time frame, three, six, nine months, to dominate the other four competitors, because you have the profitability, you have the marketing knowledge now, you have the launch and traffic capability skill sets within Amazon uh, to understand how to do each of these things, you know that in time, you're going to own that. You're going to own that spot and you're going to continue to launch products. Here's a little pro tip. The more products you put on Amazon, the more money you make. And the difference is once I drive those products into my vertical, I know that every time I do that, my customer avatar is looking for one of those products already on Amazon. I'm simply putting my product in front of them, which continues to build more and more trust with them. So again, to be very clear, it's a numerical driven model. It is a data-based model. And since 2014, we collectively, between myself and my clients uh, in our software, have launched over 60,000 FBA products. We have a ton of data. And this is a data-driven model. You read the data and then you launch the product. And so we have expected understanding uh, that 80% of the data market and expectations of that product in 90 days are going to be met in that criteria. Now, is everyone a home run? No. Is that our expectations? No. What we're looking for is a 90-day run rate of profitability and cash flow that that product can achieve within that time frame. If it does not, we simply let it run out of its units and move to the next one. Again, seven times up the bat, three times you hit home runs, all right? So my goal is then to take those products and mine the winners. And eventually you'll see three, five, 10, 20 profitable SKUs running organically inside of the system based on also what's called pay-per-click campaigns, which I'm going to buy all those other people's customers to come get my products profitably. And then I'm just going to continue to hedge in there until I dominate and own that market. And then I'll put the business up for sale. But it's all numerical driven. So the other 20%, because I can see the wheels turning and the smoke coming out of people's ears, um, is that I am not smart enough to tell the market what it wants. But after all these launches and all this time hedging in this one location in business, uh, we are now smart enough to read the data and finalize the data that Amazon gets us once we start selling it in the system because it's proprietary, they hold it. So we don't fully know the data until the product starts to sell. Then we make very smart data-driven decisions almost the same way across every niche, every product. It's the same process. Everybody thinks they're specifically unique and this is something unique. I'm sorry to say it's not. But when the numbers are driven, it doesn't matter if it's fuzzy bunny slippers to grandma. Uh, or an oil wrench to build down at the local car shop, it's going to run the same data numbers, right? It's going to run the same numbers. At the end, I don't have to be passionate about the products. I have to be passionate about making it profitable and solving the customer's solution that makes them happy and passionate about those products. I put myself in the driver's seat of the business. One quick follow-up, and I'll pass it over to Austin because I know he's got a, a follow-up question himself. Sure. How important is it for... I don't know what you refer to them as uh, if it's your client or customer or your partner or someone that that does this with you as you guide them along. But let's just call them your your client. So sure. how important is it for your client to actually buy into and believe in the product? For for example, let's say that I was your client and you had helped me to come to the conclusion that we were going to, I don't know, we were going to launch a $80 uh, foot massager. And I said, hey, you know, that sounds great. But, you know, my grandma uh, had a foot massager and uh, it, it gave her a heart attack. And I hate foot massagers and I would never touch one and I want nothing to do with them. So. I don't know if that has any relevance or not. I'm just curious if that if that is something that is is talked about when you're helping people to launch these these products that it is something that they actually believe in and would use and like and and so forth. No, pure and simple. No. <laughs> yeah. No, and, so I, and I, it really gets down again again fuzzy bunny slippers to grandma. 
Um, obviously, we're going to provide a great product because we can't charge the prices we charge without a great product. At the same time, Amazon uh, has a simple uh, commandment list. It goes like this. Thou shalt not mess with reviews. And the second one says, refer to number one. So when the product is bad, your customers will eat you alive. So you must create a good quality product that isn't going to kill grandma when she's just trying to massage her feet at the end of a, you know, a long day going back and forth to the buffet. So what we want to make sure is the products obviously are good. The reviews come in good uh, and the products are that, that we're passionate about. We're passionate about creating great products to ensure the integrity of the brand. It's very important. Uh, but I don't need to be passionate about a foot massager. And for every product out there, someone's won the Darwin Award. Okay. At the end of the day, someone has killed themselves on a massager and everybody wonders how in the hell did they strangle themselves on a rope in a massager while driving an RV down the road? I just don't understand how that happened. But that's, you know, so we have to be careful with that. But yeah, the simple answer is no, I am passionate about building a great product and brand uh, that others will get behind and understand, like, feel an emotional attractiveness, tell their friends, come back and leave a great review and get a great experience that solves the solution that they were originally looking for when they purchased it. All right. So I've got kind of a follow-up that's similar to what Landon just asked, but sure. I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. So, you know, you say that the main demographic on Amazon, and it's not just that you say it, it's just, you know, the statistics back this up, but the, the main purchaser on Amazon is a 27-year-old or older female, right? Yep. I'm not female. Yep. But I also buy stuff on Amazon. The The question I have, though, is so for me, for whatever reason, I I got a pair of golf joggers maybe a month ago. And oh. they are the most comfortable pants out there. And I spent some time on Saturday looking on Amazon for more of these golf joggers and are there different brands and do I want this exact brand and, you know, all those sorts of things. Now, we, we do know that there are plenty of women who buy clothes for their husbands. Mm. So mm. launching a product that's a male product and catering it to, you know, your advertising or whatever to women is probably the direction you would go would be my guess. But mm. is that, I mean, do got do, do, do you typically hone in on that and say golf joggers, they're kind of the new thing. Everybody's starting to wear these golf joggers and they look like slacks and you can wear them for business meetings too, if you want, but they're super comfortable and you can play golf in them. And then we're going to say companion product, companion product, companion product. And that's how you build it out, but you're still gearing it towards that 27 year old female. Yes. Because okay. some of that's the secret sauce. You're just asking a secret sauce question and, and, and we're not McDonald's, so I can't give you the secret sauce. No, <laughs> in, in all seriousness though, like you're looking at the golfer shorts, but you're slightly different. Uh, typically, the all the data online, this isn't just me, shows that men typically have more of an analytical decision, uh, decision-driven model. And you may be looking, if I'm not correctly, mostly at price points and whether other men sort of like that price and, and reviews are sort of there, but you're mostly just kind of price-driven. That's a typical male demographic for buying. Uh, women are typically more emotional. They're gift giving. They're thinking of others a lot of times. They're thinking of their family. They may be thinking of you and going, I don't want him to buy the shorts that are going to embarrass him. He might look good in the plaid, even though he doesn't think he does. So I'm willing to spend the $49 for a birthday pair of shorts that I'm going to give him as a surprise. And he's just going to love them and show them off where you're thinking, no, the $29 ones would be okay. If they tear, I'll just get another one. Uh, so we're very different in that driving and appeal. Can you obviously, yeah, I see you laughing because I'm, I'm right. Am I? Uh, to a degree, I may not be 100% right, but I'm pretty over the target. You know, men do buy stuff, absolutely. But their decisions and emotional as well as justifications are very different. And that's what I'm getting down to. Women will buy most of the stuff for the home and the family. And therefore, they spend about 10 times more than men do uh, in terms of products that are for everyday use and consumption. Now, men will typically be, buy the bigger products or the larger things or the women's like, I don't know, pick whatever TV you want. You're like, yay. And you go out and get the, you know, 8K, $8,000 television, and then you hear it. Uh, women are typically like, well, we don't need that television. This one's going to be just fine. The kids don't need to watch it anymore anyways, because they're already two beds and they come home and all they do is turn the television on and blah, 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 blah. So we have to go after uh, a different aspect of that. So yes, when you take that short or when you take that gift, it literally gets down to spinning the brand uh, and spinning the brand such a way where it might be a justifiable $29 pair of golf shorts, or you will. Uh, or joggers, but I can actually take that and re-spin it towards my affinity demographic and sell the same product at a little bit higher quality for $49. Mm -hmm. 
when I do that, I've not only shifted the value presentation of that product or any product that's represented in that brand, and I've also shifted my ability to market and make that profitable in the marketplace. And because of those things, I can serve a larger demographic longer uh, with a better product. And we're talking about products that can stay online for three and five years uh, or more, literally. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just to be clear, golf joggers are pants yep. that have like an elastic band at the, at the bottom, but they look like they look just like slacks. Right. And so I've worn them to business meetings. They are extremely comfortable. And the price point is about 89 bucks. So it fit seems like it's, you know, the right fit for something. Seems like you just figured out a brand. Now we just have to spend it to the avatar. <laughs> Austin yeah. will be launching a high, high affinity brand of, of pants. There you go. Yeah. yeah only clothing. I wouldn't go. They're going to be launching their golf, their golf Amazon store here pretty soon. Golf Amazon store. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's a lot of opportunity. But yeah, I understand where you're going. Uh, it literally gets down to, to the thing uh, at the end of the day that uh, you know people get caught up in the mechanics a lot of times about how this kind of business on e-com works and think that there's some magical push button component of this where if I just push more buttons, I'll make more money. And really, we spend a majority of our time helping them focus on the business level and the avatar solution and then getting that in front of that seven lanes, you know, 24-7, 365 traffic that is on Amazon. When I started, it was like two lanes. And we were doing crazy stuff in two lanes. Well, it's seven lanes now, right? And because of that, it's just a matter of you getting your lemonade stand up there closer to that traffic stand. And instead of you selling, you know, pink lemonade, you got the yellow lemonade plus the cookie. And because of that, you're charging 20 bucks and the guy next to you is charging 10. And people are like, hey, cookie, high perceived value, right? I see this as a better deal. I'm willing to pay that money for it. I'm willing to get that experience. I'm willing to get that solution. Um, those pants you mentioned might even be the kind I've seen before where you could spill water and stuff on them and it just goes right off, uh, which is perfect for guys like us, um, who just spill stuff all the time or work outside. And and these, uh, you know, these are pretty much indestructible types of products, which are good for guys and the women like them because they don't, if they're doing a laundry and not saying all women are, because I'm going to get stereotyped, which is not what I'm trying to do here, uh, is the laundry component might be more difficult. Um, if, unless they can keep it clean. Now, again, I have a house full of kids. So laundry, I'm thinking of this from my perspective. Uh, the laundry piles up like every couple of days. <laughs> uh, and what we can clean easier is always better. But yeah, it's again, it's that brand perception. It's that quality. It's that affinity level. And because of that, we are able to charge more and provide great products and great brands. That's really what it gets down to. And anyone can do it. Uh, just I got a guy here who has a, a golf course degree uh, and a, in management and a degree in theology. Uh, who had no experience whatsoever, didn't know what product he didn't, you know, you don't need to bring a product to the table because we're going to teach you how to find them. And he found a niche that we helped him qualify. He brought the product to us. It was the high-end luxury betting uh, area. And he said, I want to try this one. And we said, well, let's spin this just a little bit this way, go this direction. He launched the product in 45 days, was over 100000 a month in recurring revenues um, with about $40 in profit per unit. So he's extremely happy with it. And so are we. But it created a great brand and just a little bit of spin on that product and validation and all the difference. Yeah. So where 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 did you find this guy or this or or how did he find you? And how do you kind of because I would imagine a, a lot of people like myself or Austin, you know, entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe they're not necessarily an entrepreneur, but they they have a, a you know a, a day job, but they they love this idea of doing something on the side to generate some. I'm doing air quotes here, you know, passive income. So how do you how do you make sure that the people that you partner up with to do this are, you know, the right the right fit, I guess, and that they really are, they're gonna. They're going to have what it takes. They're going to do what it takes. How do you how do you vet these people to make sure that you're giving them and yourself the best chance of success when you move into kind of a joint venture together, I guess, if you will? Well, and let's clarify two things you just said in that. Um, so while it is sort of a joint venture, we call it skin in the game, whereas we, we're going to work for 12 months with a person who qualifies for this, and they're going to pay for the initial part of the training then they don't pay again until we receive a, a bonus, basically, at a metric or predefined performance that will occur within that 12 months, at which point we get the rest of our mentoring fees. So we keep that what we call skin in the game. So they know we're going to be there to help them achieve that mark where we simply don't get paid the rest of our fees. 
uh, that means you know more of a JV relationship than a, than a tight business or operating agreement level. We again, we want them to keep the profits. We want them to get to a certain degree, and therefore, we're going to help them every way possible and shape to get there as fast as possible. The other component was um, who do we look for? I mean, these kinds of conversations lead for qualifications. Um, I don't have a sales team. This is not like a giant sales venture and let's scale this to a bajillion dollars a month kind of nonsense. I look for 10 to 15 qualified people and that just depends upon who they are. We have a conversation. I don't have a sales team. People talk to me directly. I have an open and honest conversation about where they are, where they want to go, what their goals and objectives are before they reached me. And they very much need to match up with what I'm doing with Voltage or we simply won't do business together. Uh, it literally is a particular group of people who understand alternatives. My lifestyle, my experience has become an alternative. Uh, I don't follow the normal path of investing. I don't follow the normal path of life. And many of the people that listen to me at this point resonate with that. They look for alternatives to wealth without Wall Street. They look for uh, vehicles to deploy capital in that they want to take to different locations and understand that they can be the CEO even if they don't understand it all yet, they're going to learn about the roles and then can transition themselves out. Why? Because they've had experience doing that in other ways. They may own multiple Chick-fil-A franchises or Subway franchises or 27 rental properties or be in the real estate and investing game and want to deploy capital into a model like this, don't need the capital to pay for their households and keep food on the table. So they're looking at the opportunity to deploy that and let the profits reinvest in the business so that it will scale faster, understanding that it is an asset that they can then uh, build and exit. Okay, So they understand as quickly as they can make that to profit, uh, they can take profits from it when it makes sense, uh, like any good business person should. Uh, without stressing the business and allowing for that a proper amount of growth while not undercapitalizing. They understand that these type of businesses need fifty dollars to $100,000 in 12 months to really exceed, meet, or exceed expectations uh, for the business model. Again, this is not like put in $1,000 and get out a million. Uh, those are all the wrong expectations. So I very much set those right expectations. We look at the ugly things. We look at the supply chain issues and we say, this is how we're overcoming them, but be aware uh, that's why there's opportunity. There's blood in the streets. And because of that, you're going to have to be a little more patient. You're going to have to take a little bit more time. But there is huge opportunities opening up in the e-commerce market right now for those who have product. Uh, and one of the things we've gotten very good at with my partner of now nine years in business, Reed, uh, the logistical right-hand super smart genius brain of our business who keeps people in product. And he's built a very strong logistics and infrastructure. He came from that. He was the CFO of a $100 million company he co-founded. Uh, he's got a very strong business experience and acumen in logistics and supply chain. And he has done a very good job of keeping us in product and keeping our clients in product. So once they understand some of these initial criteria, they also understand that there's a lifestyle business here to be had. You can run this from anywhere in the country or the world. I don't have a warehouse and I don't have people here. Okay. Um, it creates that lifestyle opportunity. It can diversify my income. I can create multiple brands and streams of revenue. I can go uh, quite a bit uh, deep as well as horizontal and vertical into this market base without going off into right field. Um, and it's a repeatable model that once I understand the concept of this, similar to a uh, real estate flipping endeavor, uh, that I can repeat that process. And as fast as I want to repeat it or deploy capital, I can go even faster. Uh, people like Matt Harward understood that. He came in and understood the concepts, tried to apply it, and was losing money. And when he found us, he said, that's exactly what I was looking for. And in four months, he drove a million dollars a month in revenue. And by nine months, he was doing $5 million a month. He understood the market and the you know, operations. And five years later, it's a $200 million a year company that just hit 337 on the Forbes Fast Inc. And now he's exiting that business as nine figures. So the point is that the deployment and the understanding of the model and game plan is repeatable to scale, but it does require certain things to be done. And it basically disqualifies people, some people who are listening to this, and that's okay. I can't help everybody. I'm not trying to. Um, I'm trying to help those who I know will have the greatest success of exiting the business because that's where I really make my money in the M&A business and the acquisitions and, and selling of this business. That's where we get a bit of brokers. That's where I have my performance group of my portfolios comes in. And quite frankly, that's why they're buying the businesses. So my company will manage them. Uh, so it brings a continual upside for my company on the back end, but everybody wins in that scenario. So that is, the, I guess, the simplest way to answer that. Sorry, that's too many words, but that was my simplest way to answer that. <laughs> well, that was great because I answered what my next question was going to be, which was, you know, really having 
this business model that it's built with the end in mind. And I thought that was really interesting because I believe you said that essentially the the lifespan of something like this is three to five years. Correct. I just thought I found that to be really interesting because you know immediately I thought, well, if you've got a great great a great brand and a great product and a and a great customer base, uh, why couldn't something like this last in perpetuity? Could, but uh, you know, I, I think that's you guys the, know as well as I, oh, sorry to cut you off. There's a little delay. The, the yeah, simplest no, answer is money is worth more now than later. It's called inflation, right? We all understand this concept. And by the time I exit this business in 18 months, I could make up two to three years of profit instead of waiting for two to three years. I get that cash now. What can I do with that cash? Either redeploy it into a new brand or another model or go buy a franchise over here or do whatever I'm going to do with it. But I can put those soldiers back to work as quickly as possible. And I can do it two or three years ahead of waiting. So again, cash flow is king in these businesses and they can be profitable as you grow them to exit. Now, the concept here is a one in done. Not to, not to cut you off, uh, but it was getting to the concept of, well, I do this once and I'm done. No, the whole business model is how many times can I do this and how fast can I do it? And can I build a system myself off the knowledge and execution of this one time to replicate it two or three times in the next 12 to 18 months? And the answer is yes. The answer is you can build those. And once you know the brand and you know the capital and you know your avatar, and you sell the business without a non-compete, you can go right back into the business model and redeploy your competition same way into that vertical. Because there are four or five other brands, you can go right back into that same market and do it again. But you now have the capital, knowledge, and experience to do it a lot faster. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's that's really the same. There's a financial and a, and a motivation interest to do this. It's the same way of going out and getting multiple you know, Chick-fil-A's and multiple businesses. Most of those, you have to get multiples of them to actually see the passive income really turn into something. But by the time you get to two, three, four, five of those, now you're really seeing the kind of cash flow and expectations you might have had. It won't come in the first franchise. Uh, but the beauty of e-commerce is that you can launch this positively. You can launch this profitably. And you can exit it profitably before you even start the second and third one. And what I'll do with most of my builders is as we put that out to portfolios and we're saying, hey, three to six months, this business is coming to maturity. Uh, I'm starting to socialize on their behalf and negotiate with them on their behalf uh, as what I do for them is that, hey, it's time to start another business. Go out, ramp that next business while you're selling the next one. Go ahead and start to get your assets in your, in your production and roll. And as soon as we exit that next one, you'll have the next one, you know, plan B coming right up behind it. Uh, and most of them, there's like three or four people right now that are in the process of doing that because they're going to be taking their businesses out to exit soon. So really, again, understanding that the model of repetition and the speed at which the market is now moving and the multiple digit increase uh, of the adoption of e-commerce in the last 24 months in a market that is $6.7 trillion. But Bank of America and Forrester Research have uh, stated here uh, about a couple months ago, and you can go look this up and verify it, that they're they're projecting $23 trillion in offline assets coming online by the year 2030. So e-commerce is just like, just beginning. It's just getting started. And the final thing on that point, there is no scratchers mentality. I call it my lottery mindset mentality, okay? <laughs> I see Austin laughing. Uh, that is not just because I showed up, it's not field of dreams, right? It's not just because I showed up, this thing's gonna happen. You have to put in the work. You have to put in a bit of time. But time relative to other things may be more appropriate for you. I usually ask people to take 10 to 15 hours a week to dedicate to this. That means one week, you may be 25 hours. Next week, you may be five. But you're going to do an average of what it takes to get that going. But you're going to see exactly what path to walk. You're going to understand the brands we failed at. You're going to understand the lessons we've learned to avoid. The markets inside of Amazon you shouldn't go to. Hint, don't go into electronics. I'll tell you the rest of them when you become a client. And the rest of those... <laughs> are ones that literally I'm taking you to Gold Mountain over here and I'm showing you just go mine right here. Stop asking questions. Just keep digging. And not over here to Dry Gulch where you see all the poor little Amazoners and e-com people out here with their Shopify stores or whatever dying because they can't get anybody to come find their product or they can't find any product or they don't have anything to sell because it's just fighting over scraps. Listen, you got to go this way. Experience says you got to go this way. And I have skin in the game. I, I'm not going to set them up for failure. What good would that do, right? Um, I have a three-letter last name. You can Google me. I challenge you. You will find me and TWA Airlines. <laughs> what you won't find <laughs> uh, is a bunch of bad reviews, scam sites, YouTube videos, and people being like, he took my life savings and I hate him. Uh, and mainly because I talk to everybody and I qualify them on the right expectations. 
Um, just because you show up doesn't mean you get to be a part of it. I'm really looking for the right people. That's simple enough. Yeah, well, we are very much out of time, Neil, but wow, just a cool conversation. Your business and your model and your approach is just cool and it's unique and sounds like you're doing some great things. So we certainly look forward to to uh, following your continued success. And for people that might want to link up and pick your brain, become a client, have a conversation with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, like I said, you can Google my last name. That's pretty simple. I can't hide. If you're doing your due diligence, you'll probably do it anyways. Um, you'll find my LinkedIn. Check it out. Check my referrals. See who I'm connected to. I got some great people. Uh, and then you can go to voltagedm.com, V-O-L-T-A-G-E-D-M, digitalmarketing.com. Uh, check out what we're doing there. There's a free little video, about 48 minutes that I did with Kevin Harrington. It talks about the business model in detail and, and the uh, a lot of things we talk about today, but in more succinct with some uh, really cool little bullet points uh, that you can check out. Um, that'll tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. And then really, it's just call to action is that you will text me. You're going to text me personally, and we're going to have a conversation. If we match up with goals and objectives, great. If we don't, it's not the right time. It's not the right place. And that's okay too. But I do talk to everybody to make sure it's a good fit. Sounds great. Pretty simple. Yeah. All right, Neil. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's make sure we get you back on the schedule uh, maybe in the next six to 12 months. That'd be wonderful. That'd be wonderful. We can talk about how Austin's brand's kicking butt in the golf space. <laughs> 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 or maybe that really sexy bald lotion thing we were talking about earlier that, uh, yeah. There we go. That thing could fly. There we go. Hey, 12 months, uh, you know, you might be right there with him at the rate you said you're losing your hair. So we'll see. Oh, that's cold. Man. <laughs> hey, you, you said it, not me. Oh, I said it. No one else knows that. That was the green room, bro. I ain't got to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Neil. Really that's appreciate awesome. you joining us. Thanks. Appreciate it, right. uh, you having me on. Thank you for the time. Yeah, you're welcome. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite 